I'm just going to mute everyone. Okay. Uh, today we will be uh, beginning our session on EUS for beginners. Uh, I would like to thank the Olympus team and the Boston scientific team who have been uh, very active and uh, who've helped us organize this event. Uh, thank you guys. So uh, we have Dr. Jayanta Samantha today from PGI Chandigarh, who's a very experienced endosonographer, will be giving a talk on sort of the basics, indications, uh, preparation, complications, et cetera, of EUS, uh, followed by uh, some live, uh, but sort of pre-recorded videos, just because um, in the interest of COVID and time, we have done this. And then we will have discussion um, with all the panelists who will be joining in, as well as the audience. Uh, we are well, uh, we, we would be happy to answer any questions related to absolute basics of endosonography? So there will be demonstration of how a regular upper EUS is performed and um, everybody has sort of different styles. So we have uh, Dr. Jayanta Samantha and also Dr. Shankar Jhavar, who is also an experienced endosonographer here in Nagpur uh, to join and, uh, and, and answer questions for us. So thank you all for joining in. And uh, we do see about 140 people already. So clearly uh, it's, a, it's a popular uh, thing to learn right now, I guess, EUS. And um, I'll thank you all for joining in. Okay. All right. And uh, I'm gonna request, okay. So we can start off with Jenta if you would like to uh, share your screen and-, and Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd and, share my screen. Is it visible now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. That's fine. Thank you. So at the outset. All right. Uh, thank you. Jan. Again. So at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Saurav Mukhevar and uh, Midas Medical Foundation for starting this very interesting uh, thing called the US for beginners. So we'll, we'll try to go. Uh, this would be something which will be very important and significant for people who wants to learn US. So today I'll be uh, discussing the very, very basics of endoscopic ultrasound, what we understand, what, how the ultrasound works and how we are kind of, kind of try to optimize the images that we gain uh, during the, during the procedure. What are the uh, kind of various uh, kind of indications and kind of uh, what are the preparations and the adverse effects. So as we all know that US or endoscopic ultrasound, as we know it, has traversed a very, very long distance in the last 40 years. The first US probes uh, and the instruments had come way back in 1979, 1980s. From there, in the last 40 years, basically has gone a very long, uh, a very a steep kind of, I would say an evolution from just a mere diagnostic school, uh, tool to a therapeutic modality. It's basically a combination of two technologies. One is a fiber optic endoscopy and the other is the ultrasound. So they have combined the two technologies of viewing the GI tract and also doing an ultrasound in the same uh, system in order to enhance not only the diagnostic capabilities, but now even for the therapeutic capabilities as well. We go inside the GI tract and get an US helps us to get gain a very good and a high resolution real time imaging. So two important aspects. One is a high resolution image better imaging and also it's a real time imaging as we as we kind of move the scope we can see the images real time so as i have been assigned the task of discussing on the principles the indications for eus the, what are the basic preparations that we need to give and definitely what are the adverse events i would like to highlight more on the principles of eus so whenever we talk about eus or or even for that matter a trans abdominal ultrasound the key thing is piezoelectric crystals what are these these are basically crystals whenever we pass an electrical impulse through them it generates ultrasonic waves that ultrasonic waves traverses the tissue hits the tissue gets reflected back and that is what ha that is how the whole image is generated so uh, so what happens is even for a for a, a trans abdominal ultrasound there will always be just behind the matching layer there will be a, a channel or, or, or a layer where the piezoelectric crystals are kept. So what happens is when an electrical impulse comes, the piezoelectric crystal starts vibrating. It generates the ultrasonic waves that goes through the tissues, traverses the tissues, gets reflected variably from various uh, parts of the tissues in various uh, frequencies, hits again the piezoelectric crystals, and then that again gets transmitted into, into an electrical impulse and gets, gives us an image on a monitor. So basically these piezoelectric crystals acts both as a sender of the ultrasonic waves as well as the receiver. 
So similar kind of a thing happens in, in an EUS. So we have a, a US processor. So once once an electrical impulse is generated into a transducer, it it uh, it excites the piezoelectric crystals, which generates the ultrasonic waves, which hits the tissues. Once it hits the tissues, the what happens is ultrasonic waves are just like light waves. So it, it undergoes a reflex, reflection, refraction, and various kinds of uh, uh, behavior to, uh, while it traverses to various tissues. And once uh, it has traversed to various uh, segments of the tissues, it gets reflected back, refracted back. Some of the part gets absorbed. And as a result of which, after which the reflected waves then again hits the transducer, after which it again goes back to the transducer, I mean, sorry, the processor, and we generate an US image or an ultrasonic image. So this is how, this is the very basic principle of how an US uh, uh, image acquisition occurs. So the strength of the impulse that we find on the monitor or the color of the uh, or, or the color of the pixel is basically a directly proportional to the strength of the impulse that gets generated from the tissues. So any, anything which is white has the highest or the strongest amount of reflected impulses. When there is no uh, uh, reflected wave and everything goes uh, traverses through the tissue, we get a black or a no signal. Some pointers before I go into the basic, uh, into, the, into the actual principles of EUS is that acoustic imped impedances differ among tissues. So if there is a fat, a bone, a tissue, or a malignancy, the impedances will differ between these various tissues. And this is the basic principle on the basis of which basically uh, the EUS image acquisition occurs. So as they reflect uh, reflect from various uh, impedance of the tissues, they generate a difference in the, in the electrical impulse. And that is how we get an image. So, and these US waves that I had already mentioned undergoes reflection, refraction, and scattering. Whenever there is an irregular surface, let's say there are neoplastic lesion, there will be more scattering, which will cause a difference from the surrounding tissues. And that helps in uh, leading to differentiate that particular area from the remaining areas. And definitely the, it, the quality of the image will depend on the amount of the reflected waves. So I will, in my subsequent discussion, will tell you how to maximize this image that we, get, that we acquire from the from the us uh, process procedure so the transducer one of the important uh, aspects of maximizing this image is to if the transducer is perpendicular to the target tissue because if it is perpendicular to the target tissue it hits directly onto the tissues gets reflected maximum waves is reflected back and hence we can kind of maximize the image quality Another important phenomenon that occurs is known as absorption. So a, a good amount of the ultrasonic waves gets absorbed into the tissues that will depend on how much the absorption occurs. It will depend on the viscosity of the tissue and the frequency of the sound as well. So absorption will lead to some amount of loss of the, of the ultrasonic waves. So as a result, when we increase the frequency, we increase the resolution, but because of the absorption phenomenon, the penetration depth decreases. So what happens is because of the absorption, there's a good amount of loss of the ultrasonic waves. And as we go on increasing the frequency, the resolution increases, but the penetration decreases. I'll come to in details slightly later on. So the principle is very simple. We use a transducer I had just described. Earlier, the transducer used to be a single element which had to be rotated by a rotor in order to obtain a 360 degree image. But these uh, single element transducers are no longer available. Whatever we have in modern times are the phased array transducers. So that is the reason why you will always hear people talk about a radial array echo endoscope or a linear array echo endoscope. This array is basically the principle of the transducer that is being used. It's a phased array transducer. So People might often ask the question as to if, if we have a conventional ultrasound, then why do we need an EUS? So what is the advantage of uh, EUS over a conventional ultrasound? Conventional ultrasound has to traverse through the skin, uh, to our, our abdominal fat, and there is a lot of amount of intra-abdominal or intraluminal gas that is there, which can interfere with the ultrasonic waves. And there is also the presence of fat and bone, gut wall acts as a very excellent window. It is very close to the structures that we need to examine. Let's say a pancreatobiliary structure, or let's say just outside the mediastine and we need to observe. In those situations, what happens is if you place the transducer inside the gut wall, uh, I mean, uh, inside the gut lumen, and it gets very closely proximated to the gut wall, and it, hence it enables us to get a better picture of the immediate surrounding structures of the gut wall. And Another advantage of the US is that it has a suction port, so we can suck out all the air, which is one of the major deterrent or which is one of the major hindrance to get a very good image on a conventional ultrasound. 
So it gives a very, very good window for a pantelability imaging. In fact, EUS is one of the very uh, um, accurate uh, imaging modalities for pantelability imaging over and above the other imaging modalities available. And it gives a very high resolution image because it is very close to the field where we want to actually observe or see the, uh, get the image. So what are the instruments that are available for EUS? This is some image that I have taken from, from some papers way back in 1979, 1980s. You can see how these very early prototype US scopes were there. These, these were all those single element transducers, which had to be rotated, uh, which has to be uh, used using a, using a motor to, in order to rotate the transducer in order to get the better image. Nowadays, we have two kinds of basic instruments. One is the radial echo endoscope and the other is the linear echo endoscope. What is the difference between the two? A radial echo endoscope was the first generation of echo endoscopes of the modern times where the ultrasound transducer gives an imaging plane of a scanning image of 360 degrees so basically what we can uh, we can get a 360 degree scanning image of the ultrasound this usually this uh, this echo endoscopes are uh, are oblique view forward oblique view uh, echo endoscopes so it's, it acts just like a side wing endoscope the camera is on the side and the transducer is fitted at the tip and it gives an it gives a 360 degree ultrasound scanning image the depth of the field is around three millimeter to 10 uh, to 100 millimeters and the working channel diameter is just 2.2 millimeter i'd like to reiterate the fact that radial echo endoscope primarily is for only diagnostic purposes it does not have any therapeutic purposes and even you fna or fnb cannot be done with a radial echo endoscope for that what we need is a linear echo endoscope so for a linear echo endoscope is something where which gives an ultrasound scanning image of 180 degrees it has all the various features for which it can use both for diagnostic as well as for therapeutic purposes it is again has an oblique view uh, ob oblique forward wing uh, camera and the depth of field is similar as that of an uh, radial echo endoscope of 3 to 100 millimeters and the working channel diameter is 3.7 mm and hence it can be used both for diagnostic as well as therapeutic purposes as of now the role of radial echo endoscope is very limited in fact, if someone, or as a beginner, if someone wants to learn echo endoscope, one should learn the linear echo endoscope anatomy rather than uh, spending time on the radial echo endoscope. As of now, I think the radial echo endoscope uh, has a role only uh, probably for examining the gut wall properly. If there is a submucosal lesion, let's say you want to examine the wall of the esophagus, in those situations, probably radial echo endoscope will uh, score over, over and above a, a linear echo endoscope. And definitely, if you want to do a diagnostic rectal EUS, in those situations, probably a radial echo endoscope scores over linear echo endoscope. Other than that, linear echo endoscope is self sufficient to, for both the diagnostic as well as the therapeutic purposes. So these are the various scopes available from various companies. We have the Olympus, the Pentax, and the Fujinon. Uh, primarily, we are uh, habituated to using the uh, Olympus and the um, Pentax scopes. There is one kind of uh, US probes that are available, which are known as the catheter probe US, catheter-based US probes. These can be, uh, these actually kind of, uh, they have a, a rotor, rotor at the tip of the uh, tip of the probe. And these, uh, these uh, catheter-based probes uh, are basically can be, uh, are used through the working channel of the endoscope. So when you put an upper GI endoscope, you can push the uh, these catheter-based probes of the US through that working channel and kind of, target a specific lesion or a small, let's say a gastric lesion, or maybe a, there is an esophageal stricture which you want to examine. So this is kind of an esophageal stricture where a, a, a catheter probe or also known as a mini probe US is used to examine the uh, intricate details of the um, of the wall of the, uh, of the characteristic lesion of the wall. The usual range that is available for these kind of mini probes are 7.5 to 20 megahertz, sometimes even 30 megahertz is, are available. They give a detailed imaging of the GI wall layers and these are also used for biliary and pancreatic interductal ultrasound. So the same probe can be used both for both for imaging of the GI wall layer, let's say for a small strictures, for a small submucosal lesion, and these same probes can be used for pancreatic and biliary interductal ultrasound. Coming to the basic US processors that are available, we have the Olympus UME2, the Aloka system for, for the Pentax, the Hitachi system for all practical purposes. We, uh, we use the Olympus system of the UME2 or the uh, Pentax system with the Aloka system. So I'll now go into slight details of the what is, how does a working end of a linear echo endoscope works? So this is the, this is the ultrasound probe that is there at the tip. This is the camera that we can see over here. For, uh, in, in the, uh, this, uh, this, the, 
the disposition of the camera as well as the working channel and the elevator is exactly like a side wing dronoscope just you can imagine that this is basically a part of a side wing uh, side wing dronoscope above which a transducer has been attached if you see a lateral view there is a, you will find there is a groove over here where we we attach the balloon so we use this balloon for in, uh, inflating air uh, sorry inflating water in order to uh, reduce the uh, in order to get a better echo enter interface between the probe transducer probe and the gut wall so in order to get a better uh, maximize the us image for all practical purposes the balloon is used more with a radial echo endoscope as compared to a linear echo endoscope and this is how uh, uh, when, once you pass a needle or an accessory this is how the um, the, the accessory comes out of the um, working channel of the echo endoscope and this this accessory can be slightly modified uh, i mean kind of, kind of manipulated with the help of the elevator just like we use in cases of ercp so now we need to understand as to how to use the echo endoscope to optimize your image acquisition this is important because we we are trying to do two things one we are trying to search for the lesion first and once we have uh, we have found out the lesion we need to characterize the lesion so one for searching of the lesion we need a deeper and a wider scanning of of the of the of the tissues and a sharper images to avoid artifacts and then once we have targeted the lesion then we need to focus on the characteristics of the lesion and we need a higher resolution image of the lesion in order to characterize the lesion and also avoid the various artifacts which can lead to a false impression of the characteristic of the lesion so what are the various things that we can adjust in order to get a better tissue image uh, better tissue um, imaging so what are, this is the this is the uh, uh, representative photo of uh, what you can see is the is the keyboard of the olympus eume2 and what are the various things there are various buttons that are available over here using which we can kind of adjust the various image qualities of the uh, us image that we get and as a result optimize our image uh, interpretation so what are the various things that we basically use our frequent we can adjust the frequency gain contrast the focus of the of the image the depth of the image and definitely a very common uh, function is the doppler image to see look for the vessels I will not go into the details of various other image enhancement techniques such as elastography and contrast enhanced uh, EUS because that is completely a different talk altogether. So first, I'll go with frequency. So we have a range of frequency with the with the echo endoscope starting from five megahertz, six mega uh, six point uh, six megahertz, seven point five megahertz, ten megahertz, and twelve megahertz. So this is the range of the frequencies that we get. We can adjust that with this button over here on the on the on the keyboard. We need to understand that as we go on increasing the frequency, the resolution increases, but then the depth of the penetration decreases. As I already mentioned earlier, that this occurs because of the phenomenon of absorption. So if we want to get a better resolution image, we can increase the frequency, but at the cost of the penetration. So this is where I can, I can show you that at 5 megahertz, you can see that we can see at the further depths of the US image. But as we increase, go on increasing the frequency, the distal part of the of the uh, field of the echo uh, of the US image becomes blurred. But, uh, but, uh, as, but on the contrary, we get a much better resolution of the image. So what we do is we adjust the frequency, higher the frequency, better the resolution. So we can see over here at 6 megahertz, you can see this kind of an image. As we increase it to 12 megahertz, we can get a much better resolution of the cassis revelation. So probably what you can do is when you want to scan the US, when you want to scan the field, you can use a lower frequency so that you get a better depth, better penetration, uh, better depth and better penetration of the tissue. So you can know where they were, whether you're missing a lesion or not. Once you have found out the lesion, then probably you can go on to a higher frequency in order to properly delineate the characteristic of that lesion. Next, we come to gain. What is gain? Gain is as simple. We increase the gain. We in make it this, make, make the image much more brighter. So as we increase the gain, this is where you get the scores of the gain. So here you can see it's nine. So there is this is uh, this is a small gist that you can see. At a, at a lower gain, this appears darker. As we increase the gain, it uh, becomes very bright. The problem with a high gain is that although it increases the brightness, but this in leads to a, more, uh, a lot of noise. This adjacent noise which we do not need. And on the contrary, if we uh, use a lower gain. It, 
it gives a much lower noise but again we we tend to lose structures so what we need to do as an endosonographer is to adjust the gain in order to optimize the image so that we get the best characteristic of that particular lesion that we are trying to demonstrate or trying to find or find out this this can differ from lesion to lesion and this in, improves with as the endosonographer goes on learning as to how to adjust the gain Next comes the contrast. As we all know, even on a TV remote, we find the contrast. We in increase the contrast, we get a much sharper image. We need to we adjust the contrast in order to optimize the image. So these are the various kinds of image, and uh, these are the various kinds of buttons, or these are the various kinds of features of uh, UOS which are needed to use in order to optimize the image so that we can get a, get hold of a better characteristic of the image that we are trying to get, because that will help us in better delineation and interpretation. There is one thing called a spatial time compensation, or which is also known as a time gain compensation. What is this? So as the waves, as the ultrasound waves goes deeper and deeper into the deeper tissues, what happens the as it gets reflected from the deeper tissues, it tends to lose the amplification. So as a result, we get much darker kind of um, images from the deeper tissues on whenever we look into and do an US image, right? So what needs to be done is what we uh, what we need to do is if we want to visualize let's say a deeper tissue which we are not able to reach adequately with the us us probe in those situations what we use is known as a spatial time compensation what it does is the processor kinds of amplifies the reflected waves from the deeper tissues as a result of which we get a much better visualization of the distal part of that us image so when at default mode you'll find something like this this is at where where at default mode at various points at 0, 3, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 centimeters at various depths the setting is kept at zero let's say once and uh, we want to uh, visualize a deeper tissue and want to enhance the image where that is getting uh, reflected from the deeper tissues then we go on to this stc menu or the spatial time composition menu you will find this kind of various depths are mentioned so let's say we want to find out or we want to or we find that there is a lesion and we want to better visualize that lesion but it is let's say at, at the level of three centimeter or four centimeter then what we do is we increase the increase the stc uh, compensation over here and then what we find out that you will find that at three centimeter there is a there is an increase in the amplification of the reflected waves so that will help in better visualization of that level uh, of the tissues that gets uh, of that level of the uh, image so let's say this is a this is a contrast enhanced us that is being carried out and this is the default mode that is there and you can see clearly that on see after the contrast has been injected we cannot actually because this is a large lesion we are not able to kind of understand what is the contrast enhancement pattern at the distal part of this lesion so what we do is we increase the stc at this level so once we increase the stc you can see over here once the stc has been compensated now you can clearly see the what is the contrast enhancement pattern the distal so this is the advantage of a spatial time compensation where we want to increase the the reflected waves uh, amplify, amplify the reflected waves that get, comes from the deeper tissue in order to get a better image of the deeper tissues then comes the depth depth is another function where we use the focal uh, focus depth in order to increase the resolution at the desired depth so basically what happens is ultrasonic waves behaves just like light so we have all read in in in, in the physics of light that there is a focal point so what we do over here is to we in we set the focal point at specific levels at where we want the resolution to be the best so as we keep keep on increasing the um, increasing the focal depth that is the place where we get the best resolution of the image so if there is a if there is, if we want to uh, visualize a deeper tissue we probably kind of set the set the focal depth at a, at a, at a depth and when, whenever you want to uh, kind of have the focus depth or the resolution at, at, a, at a superficial tissue level, then we decrease the focal depth. So this is how we adjust the focus in order to attain, at, achieve a better resolution. Next comes the function of the Doppler. This is everyone is aware of this Doppler function. This, this is available on the keyboard with three modes. One is the B mode, the, the flow Doppler or the, or the routine Doppler mode, and then there's the power Doppler mode. So once we switch on the power Doppler mode, we what we get is that the vessels get, uh, get uh, we see the flow inside the vessels and we can identify the vessels adequately and the flow uh, therein. We can adjust the, the Doppler mode again with the, these kinds of various buttons that are available. We can increase the flow gain or decrease the flow gain. What happens many a times we must have observed that once we uh, switch on the power Doppler, the, the flow of the, the power Doppler seems to go beyond the 
margins of the vessels. This is known as blooming artifact. We can sometimes decrease the blooming artifact by decreasing this flow gain. There are various kinds of other modes that are available, like the power Doppler mode, the high flow mode, which can be used in order to modify the Doppler waves that we are trying to interpret. Another important aspect of US imaging is tissue harmonics. So what is tissue harmonics? Basically, whatever uh, there are a lot of waves that are being generated by the transducer hits the tissues and comes back. So the fundamental echo signals that we have are those which are generated by the transducer. And then there are certain echo signals which are generated practically by the tissues. Those are known as the harmonic echo signals. So once we switch on this tissue harmonic echo signal, what happens is that these signals that uh, the transducer is receiving gets filtered and only the tissue, uh, only the harmonic echo signals which are generated by the tissues gets captured by the transducer and gets reflected. So this option is, over, uh, is available on the keyboard. Uh, usually at by default, it is in the off mode. Whenever we want to uh, switch on the tissue harmonic mode, we can switch on to the THEP or the THER and uh, get up, um, get the tissue harmonic mode. So what happens is once we switch on the tissue harmonic mode, it gives a much better resolution of the image but, and decreases the noise. The adjacent noise that is there because of the fundamental echo signals decreases and we get a much better resolution, but this is definitely at the cost of, a, cost of the penetration depth of the, of the image. So this is, I'll, I'll give an example. Let's say we are observing a bile duct or we are observing a gallbladder and we find that there are some noise artifacts over here and we're not sure, or even for that matter, when we try to observe in the gallbladder and we found that there is kind of a sludge-like material, we are not able to sh make sure what is the, uh, whether it is an artifact or is it actually a sludge, we switch on the tissue harmonic and we can get a much better clear picture because the artifacts gets uh, reduced, the noise decreases and we get a much better resolution of these kind of images. So this is an important uh, use of tissue harmonic uh, where we want to kind of get a better resolution in these kind of anechoic structures, but a lot of sounds kind of help uh, is disturbing. Many a times what happens is uh, another very is uh, I'll come later on. There is a very uh, common artifact, which is known as a side lobe artifact. These things can be reduced with, with the use of this tissue harmonics. Now I'll come to artifacts as I was talking about. Once we have uh, gone through these basic modes, how we are kind of uh, switch around all these kinds of modes in order to enhance the quality of the image. We need to understand at the same time, the, what are the various artifacts that appears because these artifacts needs to be interpreted in a fashion in order to be able to characterize the lesion. So there are various two groups of artifacts. One is the propagation group artifact and the attenuation group artifact. So propagation group artifact includes reverberation, ring down artifact, refraction artifact, mirror images. There are various other artifacts have been mentioned. I'll go through, through some of the basic um, artifacts that have been described. And when we talk about attenuation group artifacts, we talk about shadowing uh, uh, artifacts and enhancement artifacts, right? So what is reverberation artifact? Reverberation artifact is nothing, but whenever the, between the transducer and the, and the luminal wall, some amount of air gets trapped, it, it leads to uh, it leads to multiple echoes with, with over there. This is a very common artifact which we found over uh, when we are using a radial echo endoscope. Some amount of air or fluid gets trapped, and then what we have is, uh, is there is multiple the waves are getting uh, reflected multiple times within that small space, and we get this kind of ring kind of artifact. This is known as a reverberation artifact. We can decrease these kind of reverberation artifacts by using a balloon when we are using a radial echo endoscope. What is ring down artifact? Ring down artifact is, is another very commonly encountered artifact, which occurs because there is a resonant vibration because uh, air bubbles get trapped uh, because of the trapping of the waves within the within a small air bubbles. This is known as what is known as resonant vibrations or ring down artifact. These kind of things happens when we, let's say, when we are trying to visualize the bile duct, when we are trying to visualize the interpretive billet radicals and that is pneumobilia. So then we, you kind of get this kind of a ring down artifact. So then you know that probably yes there is air getting trapped in, in within that duct and leading to this kind of a this kind of an artifact mirror image mirror image is a very very common uh, uh, artifact which comes when you are doing an eus this primarily occurs because there is a very probably a highly reflective surface which acts as a mirror this happens when you are doing an upper upper uh, eus we, it happens when you when you are uh, visualizing the diaphragm and when you are doing a rectal eus because of interluminal gas i'll show you a, a video of this you can see this is the transducer and this is the reflection of the transducer, which is acting just like a mirror image, uh, 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 as if this is the mirror and and the, the mirror and the image of the of the transducer is getting reflected over here. This happens because of interluminal gas, uh, interluminal gas and air. So the best uh, technique to kind of avoid this kind of mirror image is to insufflate more fluid, suck out all the air bubbles, and sometimes use the 
uh, use a balloon in order to avoid this kind of mirror image. But these kind of images can occur, which gives a false impression of probably some lesion uh, occurring over here. But this is nothing. But this is just a mirror image. Acoustic shadowing is something which we are very very familiar with. We commonly find any kind of calcified structures which are, which is highly reflecting. It leaves a shadow behind it. It's known as acoustic shadow. We see gallbladder calculi. We see uh, we see pancreatic duct calculi with a lot of shadowing. This is acoustic shadowing. What happens with acoustic shadowing is that the the light or uh, the ultrasound waves hits the um, hits the calcified structure, gets reflected back, so it shows bright, and there is a shadow behind it. Just the opposite of this acoustic shadowing is what is known as acoustic enhancement or posterior acoustic enhancement. What happens is if there is an anechoic structure or an attenuated structure, uh, uh, then what happens behind that structure, there is an enhancement of the, um, of the tissues. This is not abnormal. This is, this, this is not abnormal as compared to the rest of the tissues. It is, this is known as acoustic enhancement is because of this uh, uh, low echoic structure, which is uh, just ahead of that uh, acoustic enhancement area. So these are the various basic artifacts that I've kind of discussed. So uh, I'll come. So here ends my discussion on the principles. So I have discussed about the uh, what are the various buttons that we can use to enhance or ima the image quality. What are the various artifacts that we need to look for? And I'll come to the indications. I think indications for US is something which every gastroenterologist today, starting from resident to faculty, everybody is aware of. There are two, two broad category of indications. One is either your diagnostic indications, and then there are, there are therapeutic indications. So for diagnostic indications, I'm not going to the details. Everybody is aware of diagnostic indications. We have an esophageal lesion. There is an esophageal malignancy or carcinoma. We need to stage those lesions. We need to find out. We need to characterize the esophageal wall. We use an EUS. We need to characterize the, uh, the, st uh, the character of the stricture in the esophagus. We can use a mini probe. Various kinds of gastric lesions, whether it's a gastric tumor, a lymphoma, uh, a subepithelial lesion, a submucosal lesions. We can use the US to better characterize the lesion as compared to the other modality of imaging. Biliary pancreatic pathologies, probably US is one of the forerunners in today's day for, for diagnostic purposes for biliary pancreatic pathologies and can score over at many situations, can score over CT and MRI in these situations. Definitely another, another important indication, diagnostic indication is lung malignancies. There are various, various stations of uh, uh, lung cancer staging where the US can be used such as, uh, such as on stations five, seven, four, eight, where we can use kind of uh, US can be used for lung cancer staging as well. And definitely as a part of the diagnostic, once we have diagnosed the lesion, we need to sample the tissue. Again, US is used for tissue sampling, be it FNA for various cystic lesions or an FNB for any, uh, for any kind of solid lesions. Even liver biopsies are currently being done. Uh, routinely with, uh, to kind of uh, US is used for uh, getting a good tissue in US liver biopsy. Now I'll come to therapeutic US. Therapeutic ways the indications have broadened and, and the spectrum is ever increasing in the field of therapeutic US, starting from fluid collection, drainage, be it any kind of pancreatic fluid collections, be it pelvic fluid collections, pelvic abscesses, any kind of abnormal uh, abdominal fluid collections to ductal drainage, both the biliary and the pancreatic duct drainage. If the routine ERCP fails, then uh, the ductal drainage can be done. Then comes to celiac plexus neurolysis or, neurolysis or block for patients having pancreatic cancer, chronic pancreatitis, they are to really alleviate the pain. Then comes the various kinds of indications for vascular interventions, primarily two broad categories. One is we talk about uh, varicial coiling and the other, other we talk about is the pseudoanosinal coiling. These can be done and definitely various anastomotic procedures are now being done using therapeutic US starting from gastro gastro gastrojejunostomy, jejunojejunostomy and even gastrogastrostomy such as the edge procedure. So the spectrum of therapeutic US is uh, gradually over the years have increased paramount um, as, we, as we go ahead. So this is a basic, this is one of the probably the basic uh, um, US therapeutic procedure, which is, uh, which is the fluid collection drainage. This is a pancreatic fluid collection, one drainage we commonly use. We puncture with a needle, we uh, pass a guide wire, and then we place the stent. Again, various, kind, various kinds of abnormal collections, such as this is a biloma that has been drained using, using US guidance. And, and this is the inside of the biloma that we can see. Coming to US guided ductal drainage, we all know about US guided biliary drainages. Again, uh, there are various uh, patterns and techniques of US guided biliary drainage. This is something which you are not going to. There is US guided hypergogastrostomy, US guided anti grade stenting, US guided colidocodonostomy, US guided rendezvous technique in those situations where there is an accessible papilla but you are failing an ERCP. So there are various kinds of techniques and procedures that are available for, for draining the duct using US. 
So this is US guided hepatogastrostomy. You puncture in the intrahepatic duct, and what we are trying to create is we are trying to create a a, a, a permanent kind of a, a fistula between the between the left ductal system and the stomach, and then we place a stent uh, and uh, help in, in drainage of the of the intrahepatic biliary radicals. Again, US guided cholecystectomy. We position the US scope in the duodenum and then drain the CBD, placing a stent. Similarly, US guided anti-grade stenting can sometimes be done. Let's say the papilla is not reach, uh, reachable, but then the, the lesion is lower down, in, 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 close to the papilla. We, we puncture similar, just like the US, we puncture the intrahepatic ductal system. We, we dilate the system and then we kind of place the stents. Similar is the US guided rendezvous procedure. It's just a procedure which kind of helps in aid in the ERCP. US guided pancreatic drainage similarly can be done. So, Basically, the uh, basically the indications for U.S. interventions has been increasing in, uh, in in leaps and bounds, and various kinds of interventions can be done in the gastrostomies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now I'll come to the various kinds of upcoming interventions that have been uh, coming up. Pancreatic cyst ablation is something which is now being regularly being done using RFA probes. Even various kinds of pancreatic entities are being used with RFA probes. And various kinds of upcoming interventions such as cancer therapy in the form of chemotherapy, brachytherapy, fetal shelf marker placements are now in the experimental stage, but again, can be are, are the future of US interventions. How will you prepare? It's very basic preparation uh, for all upper GI US procedures. You need to keep the patient NPO for six hours. A pre procedure evaluation definitely has to be done. So you need to define what are the basic investigations. Why do you need to do the US procedure? And definitely then you need to get hold of your, uh, of your anesthetist and what kind of sedation and anesthetic assessment has to be done. What are the risks for the anesthesia if the patient is being is to be done under propofol sedation or maybe a, a general anesthesia. Coagulation profile might need to be seen if you are planning for an US procedure where you are uh, a diagnostic US where you are planning for an FNN or an FNP as well. We need to look into the previous medication history as to whether the patient is on some anticoagulation medications or not. Prophylactic pre procedure single dose uh, antibiotic need, uh, needs to be given if we are planning for, a, let's say, a pancreatic cyst aspiration, etc. And most important is an informed consent. Informed consent will definitely be one of the key things which we need to do before you undergo any procedure for that matter. For rectal US, again, a routine bowel preparation as you go for a colon. Sometimes a scoring may be used, whether the bowel preparation is adequate or not. And definitely the remaining things remain the same, a pre-procedure evaluation, sedation, coagulation profile, and informed consent. When we talk about therapeutic procedures, again, the similar kind of things occurs. We keep the patient NPO for six hours, pre-procedure evaluation, coagulation. But the most important point for therapeutic US is we need to understand that US therapeutics, although it's one of the safest kind of therapeutic procedures, but it has its own catastrophic complications. So some of the things which need to be more emphasized is an informed consent. You plan with your technician as to what are the steps you need to go, you are going to do so that your technician is in sync with you during the procedure. Check for all the accessories, whether they're working or not. Keep a backup of the accessories. And definitely, and most importantly, for procedures such as U.S. guided biliary drainage, U.S. guided pancreatic drainage, and even for U.S. cystogastrostomies, inform your surgery and radiology colleagues for backup. Adverse events. If you are talking about a diagnostic U.S., it's, it's as safe as any routine diagnostic upper GI, lower GI that we talk about. The complications will be similar, like perforation, bleeding, need for surgery. So for diagnostic U.S., the safety profile is very similar to any routine investigative procedure. But for therapeutic procedures, yes, the adverse effect profile percentage is pretty high. Uh, for biliary diseases, ranges from 15 to 30 percent. For cystogastrostomy, 10 to 15 percent, and, and gastrostomy, 12 to 20 percent. So for these situations, we need to understand. For therapeutic procedures, the patients needs to be primed and counseled very well. And all the various adverse effects that could be there should be kept in mind. And you should always have a backup as to uh, uh, what to do once things starts going wrong. So to be an endo a good endosonographer as a beginner, I would like to put across some take home messages. Believe that US is not difficult. As we need to understand that we are all DM, DMB, uh, we are doing DMs and BNBs and GI surgeons, we are not radiologists. So we are not very well aware with these, with these kind of gray and white images. And initially, when you start doing an EUS or you stand behind your mentor trying to learn EUS, you always find it very baffling that there's so much of the gray and white images and not able to understand why. You need to give more time and you gradually you will be able to understand and interpret an EUS image. So you have to believe that EUS is not difficult. You need to know your equipments. You need to know your processor, how you kind of, kind of can optimize the, optimize the image, image quality. 
And if you have to learn one, I'll reiterate the fact you learn linear US anatomy, as Dr. Saro will just now, I will uh, subsequently kind of give you an in brief introduction about it. Familiarize yourself with the gray white images. Do not rush. Once you have trained yourself in endosonography, you're going to do US all your life. So please learn diagnostic US first. Uh, as I'm sure that all the panelists, including Dr. Saro, will agree with me that diagnostic US is 10 times more difficult than a therapeutic US. You need to understand and learn your diagnostic US before you harp on uh, going ahead with the therapeutic US and watch and learn from your mentor because Rome was not built in a day. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Janta. That was a fantastic uh, lecture. Uh, sorry, I think I gave you less time to give, uh, and you did manage to squeeze in a lot of, lot of important information. And even that was uh, a bit of a learning for me as well, because there are things that uh, there are sort of newer technologies coming in, and it's uh, it's it's great to learn from you. Thank you. It was a great, great talk, and um, I totally agree with you that I think um, uh, the learning curve for US is diagnostic US is, is longer than actually therapeutic US. Actually, once you reach a stage of doing FNAs comfortably, therapeutic US uh, probably takes you five or 10 procedures. A diagnostic US takes you like two or three or 400 procedures to get, to get proficiency. So thank you, for, thank you for that. Uh, all right, what we'll do is um, I'm going to uh, switch gears and uh, uh, for, for people who want to do it or have been doing a little bit of it, uh, I'm just going to share with you some basic tips, techniques on how we do basic upper US examination. And uh, as Jent also mentioned, we'll be doing linear US and that's what we all do. I do personally love radial US, but uh, again, with lack of uh, applications and uh, changing scopes, everybody sort of moved towards doing uh, linear US is only in certain uh, conditions like what Jenta mentioned. Uh, epithelial, subepithelial lesions and rectal lesions where uh, radial can actually play some role. Uh, linear US seems to do the, the job pretty well. Okay. So what I'm going to start off with, uh, hopefully I'm full screen now and if you guys can see it. Yeah. So, okay. So today we'll go over um, just some basics of mediastinum US, subcanonal space, AP window. Uh, liver with the vasculature, pancreas, head to tail, spleen, kidney, adrenal gland, uh, celiac axis, uh, gallbladder, common bile duct. And how to identify these structures, how the EOS is performed, how do you move the scope? And um, everybody has a different style. I'll uh, look forward to having uh, Janta's and uh, Shankar's views as well on this. Okay. So just a few basics. I think it's important uh, as you start doing it, there has to be a systematic approach uh, as you go about doing an EOS. Uh, don't rush into it. You have to recognize that there are certain sort of stations uh, as, uh, as have been described, and uh, you need to know the important landmarks. So there are certain areas uh, across the gastric and duodenal lumen where you'll find certain organs and vessels, and you have to sort of stick to that. Uh, just having a non-systematic approach will lead you to lose um, lose and miss out on structures. And uh, that's why it's important to go step by step. And uh, all right. so if you lose the way, so you're finding something, you lose the way, uh, you may want to go back to the station where you started from. Okay. So for example, which we go through, uh, you're at sea like that, and then you find the neck of pancreas and then you lose it and you don't know where you are. So you have to go again, go back to the aorta, find the sea like axis and then restart the process. Okay. Uh, know what is normal, okay? Because um, I think I spent, I probably must have at least seen 100 US examinations being done to just understand what is normal before I even started touching the scope. Um, it's only then that you'll understand what is abnormal. You see, uh, we are not radiologists. Uh, most of you guys are gastroenterologists, I suppose. So you really need to understand what normal is. So it's only then that you'll start picking up what is abnormal. Okay, so that's why you need to see a lot to stand and observe and understand and ask questions to your mentor. Okay, uh, every patient is different. Okay, so this is something that you eventually learn. That in some cases, it's just, it's pretty easy, you know, the identifying structures uh, can be very easy. But in some cases, uh, you can really, really try. And sometimes it may even get difficult or even impossible at times to identify certain structures. So 
Uh, so don't lose sweat over it if you've done like say a couple of hundred uss and then you don't find something because maybe it's really really hard to find it so every patient is different so don't lose your uh, uh, don't don't lose hope if you don't find sometimes a, a structure or two so most of us even after doing thousands have have some difficulty at times okay all right so i think jayanta mentioned air is your enemy suction 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 uh, can't tell enough. The artifacts can make uh, life difficult. Water use your friend. Use it as appropriate. I won't go into much details. Uh, the other thing, when you do a diagnostic EUS, what's important is that one snapshot is not enough. People think that, okay, I went and I, I took a snapshot of the left lobe of the liver and I'm done. That really isn't enough. You know, uh, you have to perform a thorough examination, which means you examine it in different planes. You get a sagittal view. You don't get the entire view, right? So you go through a CT scan, you don't look at the liver and say everything's normal. You go through all the sections uh, from top to bottom. Uh, in, in a similar manner, in EOS, you have to rotate the scope. You have to examine thoroughly. You don't get one snapshot and get done with it, okay? Uh, when you have a doubt between ducts and vessel, you use your Dopplers to help you out. Uh, anyways, we'll start with intubation as uh, Janta showed and uh, the ultrasound transducer at the end uh, it can make a slightly challenging intubation. So the view what you get is oblique. So just remember, you don't look in front like an endoscope, not side as a duodenoscope. So you get sort of an oblique view and, excuse me, get familiar with it, okay? You have a blunt front end. So be careful as you advance the scope, okay? And as, as you learn in most endoscopies, never push if there's any resistance, especially at upper esophageal sphincter or the D1, D2 junction. Those are the two areas where, where complications and perforations happen. Other areas are fine, uh, but never push if there's resistance, okay? Why? Because sometimes at UES, you are, uh, you are in a diverticulum, especially in older patients, and next thing you know, you will perforate the, the wall of the diverticulum by not uh, knowing. So always, if you have a problem, pull the scope out, put your standard upper endoscope, visualize the diverticulum, or whatever there is, if there's a stricture sometimes. So visualize, ensure what you're doing, and then put the scope back. So even after like so many years, still there are times when I feel resistance, I go back, ensure, look at the anatomy, go back, put the scope again, maneuver the scope appropriately and get forward, okay? So uh, we'll just, uh, I hope the, one second, I'm just going to lower this. We'll have audio on full, all right, so. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and intubate the esophagus now. So just like any side wing, now this is an oblique wing scope. So you do get some views, not all. So I just go over the tongue gently, right? And I'm going to use my big wheel towards me. As I hit the back of the throat, I'm going to use my torque, gentle right clockwise torque, and then gentle clockwise torque. And there you go, now you're inside the esophagus, okay? So, that's, uh, there was just a demonstration of how do you intubate. Now, uh, there was a question in the chat box as well. So again, you do it just like a duty to scope and most of you probably are doing ERCPs by now um, if you are planning to learn the US. Uh, so you get it across the back of your tongue and then uh, with your big wheel towards you and then push it till you reach the upper esophageal sphincter. At that point, what I find really helpful is say a 30 to 60 degree clockwise rotation of the scope as that will help you maneuver the scope and get it across the upper esophageal sphincter and then you you're in the esophagus okay so that's what so let's go through uh, spaces so the first area we want to examine is the subcarinal space this is basically i'm going to show you two areas on the standard and how to get there so one as i said subcarinal space it's below the carina where the uh, the bronchi branches in the right and left this is the space between the left atrium and the pulmonary artery i'll just show you how it should be done uh, please let me know if the audio is not uh, uh, proper or so okay demonstrate to you is uh the anatomy of uh, the mediastinum, where uh, I'm going to show you how to find the subcarinal space, okay? So now, number one, we get the echo, the endoscope at just, so I'm going to push it out. What you see on the screen is now we are in the esophagus, just moving towards the stomach, right? Okay, so now we're in the stomach, so I'm going to suction out the air, 
pull back gently. And then I'm going to torque my scope. Okay, well, I'm going to until I find the aorta. All right. So now what I've actually done is clockwise torque until I find the aorta. Now, that is a long tubular structure going from right to the left of the screen, and that's the aorta. Okay. Now, when you find the aorta, what you have to do is go uh, 180 degrees. So you look at the liver. There you go. Now it's about so you're looking at the liver, and I'm going to then gently pull back. Okay. What you will see on the screen is a pulsatile structure. Yes. So what you see, I'm pulling back. This is the left atrium on the screen. Okay. So I'm pulling back. So what you're looking at is the left atrium. All right. What you need to do next is again pull back a little bit. And then I'm going to use my big wheel towards me and a little clockwise torque, pull back, clockwise torque. All right. Now, what you see are two tubular structures. The one on the left of the screen, and I'm going to point it out for you. Okay. So the one on the left of the screen, oh, okay, I think I lost it there. Yeah. So this one is the left atrium. And, uh, and this one on the right is the pulmonary artery. Okay. So in between these two, like this area right here, this is the subcarinal space. Okay. So I'm going to stop the cursor. So you pull back, talk, talk. Okay. So this is the pulmonary artery, left atrium, and this region is the subcarinal space. You oftentimes find lymph nodes here for FNB or FNA in particular cases. Demonstrate. All right. So next area is the aortopulmonary window. This is the area underneath the arch of aorta. So this is uh, between aorta and pulmonary artery. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to demonstrate how do we find the aortopulmonary window for the mediastinal examination. So firstly, we go in the G junction, we identify the aorta, which what you see is this uh, anechoic structure here, right there. And just to show you that there's a lot of pulsatile flow in there. All right. And then what we do is we generally like to pull back, pull back, trace the aorta, Pull back, pull back, pull back. So we try to go into the mid esophagus. Yeah. Okay. Reach to the aortic arch right there. So it's sort of ending there, as you can see. Okay. So when we reach there, we use the big wheel towards us. Okay, I'm going to do this again for you. Okay. Yeah, right there. So now here's the aortic arch where it ends. I'm going to use the big wheel towards me and push the scope gently in, okay? So here, this is the window. I'm going to show you what it is. This is the aorta, this is the pulmonary artery. This is the aortopulmonary window, all right? So this is where you find mediastinal lymphadenopathy in select cases. You may have to FNA those legions, not in this one, okay? So I'm gonna show it to you again. So we are going to go to the G junction, right? Stomach, we turn around, find the G junction. This is the celiac arch, uh, this is the aorta. And then I'm gonna pull back, pull back till I get to the proximal part. I'm going to pull back, pull back more till I see the aortic arch. Okay, so here we go. So it's the aortic arch there. And then I'm going to push a little bit with a gentle clockwise start. Okay, here we are. So this is a big wheel towards me. Can you show that big wheel towards me? And I'm going to gently clockwise start. Can you show the clockwise start on the scope? Okay, clockwise start on the scope, clockwise start, and my big wheel is towards me. And there you go. So that is, um, this is the pulmonary artery, this is the aorta, and this is the aortopulmonary window. This is where we try to get uh, lymph nodes. Uh, so I'm. All right. Uh, so we'll just go forward to the next area. Now, uh, the, the more sort of important structures that you end up having to identify on a more practical basis. So 
uh, this is a station just below the G junction. You are looking at the aorta, celiac artery takeoff, uh, the neck, body, tail of pancreas. You identify the spleen, the left kidney, the left adrenal gland, and the, the venous structures, the, the confluence, splenic vein, SMV, the portal vein. Okay. So we'll just start this here. Okay. Hi. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll start with demonstration of the anatomy of the G junction. So what I'm going to show you is now I'm at the lower end of the esophagus. And the first important structure to identify is the aorta, okay? So as you talk the scope, 180 degrees, what you find this long tubular structure is the aorta, all right? I push the scope, move it back and forth gently with my big wheel towards me. I'll show you with the Doppler, this is the pulsatile sensations of the aorta and I push the scope down and I push the scope down what you have to identify is the celiac artery takeoff, okay? So here the celiac artery is coming right there. So as I talk the scope, it's coming slightly on the right of the screen. That's the celiac artery takeoff. And the crura of the diaphragm, just over here, okay? So now that's an important structure to identify. And as I see the celiac artery takeoff, then the next thing to do, is to use your big wheel away from you. Can you show me the big wheel away from you? Can you show the big wheel away? Okay, so I'm doing the big wheel away. And what you see on the screen is the pancreas, right? So this is the salt and pepper appearance of the pancreas right there. And while when you reach this point, you push the scope a little further and push it further. And what you have to do is gentle clockwise motion, okay? Can you show how I'm doing the gentle clockwise motion here? So while we are here in the counterclockwise, you see the neck of pancreas first. This is the neck of pancreas. And uh, we'll see the portal confluence just below it. So this is the confluence, okay? So splenic vein, superior mesenteric vein forming the portal vein, okay? And then I'm going to do clockwise torque here, slow and steady, clockwise torque, clockwise torque, and follow this. This is the pancreas, and you're going to follow the pancreas. You're going to follow the pancreas. Now I have my big wheel towards me with suction, and I'm going to do clockwise torque, clockwise torque, clockwise torque. What you've now reached, now you've reached the tail of pancreas, because now you see the kidney here. This is the left kidney. The salt and pepper structure is the pancreas. And then I do more clockwise torque, more clockwise torque. And I'm going to pull my scope back a, a tad bit. And now what you start seeing on the screen here is the spleen, pancreas, tail, and kidney. All right. So you do more clockwise torque. And now you have reached the spleen and the tail of pancreas right there. And what's important is to keep doing this counterclockwise and clockwise. So now what you are able to see is the entire pancreas from the neck, body, and tail region. And it's also important to go a little back and forth because you want to see the pancreas in all the planes. And right, there you go. So, yeah. And, and the more other important, the structure to be identified in the pancreas is the pancreatic duct. And I'll show you with Doppler where the duct is. I'm going to do clockwise start. So this is a regular patient, non pancreatic duct. And it's slightly difficult to identify if it's really non-dilated, but this is the pancreatic duct here. This structure here has slight hyperechoic margins, but that's the pancreatic duct. And as I do gentle clockwise motion, I have to follow it as best as I can in the body tail region. So it's non-dilated in this particular case. All right. All right. So again, counterclockwise and then clockwise all the way down to the pancreas kidney tail, spleen, all right? Now, when you are at the kidney, the other important structure to identify is the adrenal gland, okay? You move the flow. So just pull back a little bit, and then you can do a slight motions. Let me show you. When you are at the kidney, between the kidney and the spleen, there's the adrenal gland. And I'm, what I'm going to do is at, at the kidney, I'm going to do a slight counterclockwise motion with big wheel towards me. And what you see on the screen, this structure here, this one right here, 
actually let me use this this is the adrenal gland okay so this is the adrenal gland it's a seagull shaped structure right there so now i'm getting nice views of the adrenal gland okay all right so that's one all right so so that's actually ends up being sort of one of the most important things that you have to do in the previous videos what we showed uh, so next station that you'll uh, find structures is from the duodenal bulb so here you're trying to locate uh, the common bile duct the portal vein the hepatic artery and of course the common bile duct going down into the head of pancreas identify the pancreatic duct you should be able to see the gallbladder cystic duct the other location is um, transgastric near the antrum uh, and then the hepatic hilum with all that so we'll just go ahead with the okay so we're going to demonstrate how to visualize the head of pancreas what i'm going to do is uh, show you this maneuver from the duodenal bulb so now my scope is in the antrum and i'm going to advance it gently at, across into the duodenal bulb right there i'm going to use my suction to move the air and what you see immediately on the screen are a few structures a large tubular structure which i'll show you with flow this is the portal vein which is an important landmark to identify and just proximal between the transducer and the portal vein you'll find the bile duct okay so i'm going to remove this flow and i'm going to use a clockwise torque and i'm going to show you the bile duct right there so just to confirm with doppler this structure here right here this is the bile duct okay and uh, we are going to show you how do we maneuver and and force the bile duct so here is the bile duct in the uh, right right there that's the common bile duct and then we do a clockwise star gently to trace it down to the head of pancreas i'm going to use my big wheel towards me to show you the head of pancreas which is right here on the screen okay so again let's go back in show you the portal vein and then the bile duct between the and then the bile duct between the transducer and the portal vein okay. oh well that's the hepatic artery so yeah right there is the bile duct all right so hepatic artery portal vein so this is the hepatic artery this is the portal vein this is the bile duct okay and uh, well, there you go to show you this is the bile duct Okay. Right. And then what we do is use my big wheel away from me, all the suction on the scope and torque, torque, clockwise torque, clockwise torque till you course the bile duct going down, going down, clockwise torque. It's going down, it's going down, and then you see the head of pancreas. Okay. So this maneuver, you can visualize the pancreas head and just really, you know, gets sort of obstructed there in the head. You will not be able to visualize in this particular case till the duodenum, but you see that's the bile duct going all the way down, and we are seeing is the head of pancreas. So it's an important. This is important for any beginner to locate, identify, and show the pancreatic head. And what I'll show you with Doppler is this is the likely the pancreatic duct over there. Okay move the flow so now as we are at the duodenal bulb what i'll show you is uh, we trace the portal vein as we are sorry move, move forward okay so we are going to demonstrate all right so the next thing that you need to do is uh, now you've visualized the pancreas from the uh, neck body tail and the head region uh, so the other thing that must be done in each case and the pancreas examination is not complete until you do this is uh, the trans uh, duodenal examination across the second part of duodenum as you pull back uh, the scope and visualize the unsinate and the deeper structures. And I've seen cancers being missed in this area and when the examinations are not done properly. So show you how it's done. Okay. So let's look at the anatomy from the uh, second part of the duodenum. So I'm going to advance my scope in the bulb. Next, I'm going to clockwise torque and push the scope gently so that I enter the second part of the duodenum. Okay. 
just how we do with an ERCP scope. I'm going to use my big wheel. I'm going to shorten the scope right there. So yeah, now my show scope is shortened. I'm going to use suction. I'm going to remove all the air. Now with gentle clockwise torque and with the suction, we are going to start identifying structures. So you need to pay your attention to the right side of the screen on top right. What you will see is the unsinate process of pancreas coming in the view. So that's your unsinate process. And I'm going to gently do gentle pull back. The first anequate structure, what you see on the screen is the bile duct, which is closest to the transducer. So this is the bile duct and the pancreatic duct will be just inferior to that. Okay. So I'm going to do clockwise start bile duct right there. And then clockwise start anti-clockwise movement. So what you need to do is have a nice view of the unsinate process so that you can be confident in saying there's no mass, nothing is missed. There's a common bile duct right there. And then the pancreatic duct right at the bottom. This is the pancreatic duct. Okay. This is the bile duct. And I'll use the Doppler to show and confirm that for you. Right. So this is the pancreatic duct and this is the bile duct. Okay. Now, what we are going to do is um, go clockwise, counterclockwise, torque, clockwise, counterclockwise, torque. Now you're getting nice views of the head of pancreas, the unsinate. So, as I said, this is the head of pancreas in the unsinate region, the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct opening towards the duodenum right over there. So we're going to do clockwise, counterclockwise motion right there, clockwise, counterclockwise motion. And what you will be able to see and appreciate is how well you can visualize these structures and really see them coursing all the way through the head of pancreas, okay? Just gentle clockwise, counterclockwise motion. There you go. All right. So, remove the cursor. Yeah. All right. And that ends the examination. So, all right. So I'm just going to move forward uh, with the next part, just to identify uh, the liver anatomy. Now, <clears throat> I think for most beginners, it's okay to identify the left lobe of the liver and the right lobe of the liver and the vascular structures. Uh, doesn't end up being very practical. Uh, but uh, as we are describing, we will show and share with you how these various segments of the liver are identified, can get important therapeutic cases. Um, so first we start across the, the gastric wall just below the square, the SCJ, and, and there's sort of two, three stations here that you need to know. Uh, so you need to look at the right hepatic vein and the IVC and the segment one, eight, and five, and then the uh, left portal vein, the ligament venosum with the IVC and the segment one, four, and eight with the middle hepatic vein, and then ultimately the left lobe of the liver uh, with the left hepatic vein separating uh, second and third segment of the liver, okay? So we'll start with the... So what you're looking at on the screen is the inferior vena cava, and... So this is just below the squamo column of junction, uh, and then we have rotated the scope to identify the liver and identify the inferior vena cava, okay? So the large vessel coursing through the liver, as you see, is the inferior vena cava. And uh, the right hepatic vein over there, this one with a wide mouth opening in, inside the IVC. So the segment of the liver here, just between the transducer and the inferior vena cava, this is a segment one between the inferior vena cava and the right hepatic vein, segment eight. And between the, uh, and below the right, inferior, uh, well, the right hepatic vein, it's segment seven, okay? Now, when you reach this point, what you need to do is gentle counterclockwise torque, okay? So as you can expect, the next structure, what you see is the middle hepatic vein, okay? And just above the middle hepatic vein, extending from the left portal vein here is the ligamentum venosum. So, this hyperechoic band is the ligamentum venosum. So again, starting with segment one, and then what you see between venosum and middle hepatic vein is segment four, and then below the middle hepatic vein here is segment eight, okay? So one, ligamentum, ligamentum venosum, four, middle hepatic vein, and segment eight, okay? Now what I'm gonna do is more clockwise, counterclockwise start, 
more counterclockwise torque until we see the left hepatic vein now. This structure is the left hepatic vein and just between the transducer and the uh, left hepatic vein is the segment two and then below is segment three, okay? So there you go. So this is the left lobe. So, All right. so and then as we finish the examination of the, uh, uh, of the IVC and then we can look at the hepatic hilum and then the next station sort of to see is as you push the scope further down and look at the left portal vein and uh, the segment three and four and then further down is the hepatic hilum and I'll just show you how it's done. View of the liver that you can obtain from here is the hepatic hilum. So now we're going back. So we are right here, the IVC and the right hepatic vein and we do a slight counterclockwise start to see the middle hepatic vein, which I showed you here. This is the ligamentum venosum, and this is the left portal vein. And I'm going to push the scope a little bit. I'm going to push the scope a little bit. Right there is the left portal vein, okay? So when you reach this point, you're going to use your big wheel towards you, and I'm going to suction the air out, and I'm going to do slight clockwise torque, okay? With my big wheel towards me. So this is the left hepatic vein, and then going to the main portal vein over there. And uh, what you see is segment three over here, and segment four over here, and this is the, um, the portal vein being formed at the hepatic hilum. I'm going to do a counterclockwise start, and I'll show you a Doppler. This right here is the hepatic artery. This is the hepatic artery, the portal vein, and the common bile duct further down, okay? Yeah, so... As you push it down, so this right there, hepatic artery, portal vein, and then you further down, and then you can follow it down from there to the confluence. Okay. View. All right. And then lastly, uh, this is the last uh, segment. So this is examining the right lobe of the liver. Uh, it can be a sort of the more difficult uh, segment to identify and see as you have to talk the scope significantly. Uh, this is across the duodenal bulb. So you get the scope across the duodenal bulb, talk the scope uh, and follow the portal vein until it reaches the hilum and see it branching out into the right and left portal vein, which is sort of shown in this uh, illustration on the left. And then you further torque it uh, sort of counterclockwise and then find the right anterior and the posterior portal vein. And then you can see the different segments of the liver based on uh, on these two venous structures. And I'll just show you a quick video. Let, Let me demonstrate um, the anatomy of the right lobe of the liver from the duodenal bulb, all right? Now this is, uh, this can get challenging at times, but uh, let's see, now we'll get the scope across into the bulb, right? So now we suction. And immediately of the back, what you see is uh, this, which is a gallbladder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to suction and then just do a gentle clockwise start to first identify the portal vein. All right, so we're going to do a slight torque. Let me see here. All right. All right. Well. So here we go. So now what you see on the screen, this large structure with a lot of flow, this portal vein, you see the portal vein, you are going to clockwise torque. So towards the right, well, clockwise torque. And now you will reach the liver, okay? Now, this is the hepatic hilum. And uh, the portal vein branches in the left and the right side. So the right, right portal vein is this going down here and the left will go down here. All right. So let me see if I can show that for you. So there you go. That's the portal vein. Now this is your portal vein right here. This is a gallbladder. And then I'm going to suction and I'm going to turn. So now it's going left is going this way, the right is going this way, okay? So now as we see the right portal vein, then you need to talk further out, okay? Now, this 
this right here is the right anterior portal vein, and this is the right posterior portal vein, okay? The right anterior portal vein and the right posterior portal. And when you get that view, what you're really looking at in terms of segments is segment five here, segment six on this side, segment seven, and segment eight on this side, okay? So, all right. So let me demonstrate. <clears throat> okay, so thank you for that. Uh, thank you for seeing um, and my presentation there. So basically, you know, of course, and um, in, in, uh, as as best as we can in a virtual world, we, we've tried to demonstrate how this is performed. Uh, those were live recorded, unedited versions, and exactly how it's done. But um, uh, of course, it's a matter of skill as to how it's it's performed. But I just tried to show you how the scope is maneuvered and, and the sort of movements that you need to do as you try to examine these structures. So, uh, so I will uh, open the session for all the panelists and um, uh, for for you guys if you have any questions about uh, how it's done and you know more practical tips that if you need, um, Shankar, please feel free to. Uh, uh, have your screen on if you would like. Um, yes. There is some issue with on. my camera, sir. Uh, oh, here. never mind. So I'm happy to have you answer questions. Okay. All right. So we have some comments here. Uh, Dr. Bhandarkar is asking, is the CBD dilated here? Well, actually, that patient, the CBD was not dilated. It was about uh, 5 mm or so. Uh, so I, I think one must recognize that uh, what depth of uh, uh, field you're looking at, because uh, if you are looking at a very uh, a short depth of field, then all the structures look bigger. And then uh, if your depth of field is, is long, is more, then the structures look smaller. So I think... Uh, depending on the case, what you're doing. In this particular case, it was not dilated, okay? Okay. All right. Will this webinar be available later for watching? Yes, we'll, uh, we'll use the recorded version. We'll put it on our, on our social media um, platforms, etc. Uh, so Dr. Nishant Varma is asking a harmonic SHD, when should it be applied? Jayanta, do you want to answer that? When would you want to apply it? Yeah, sure. Whenever we have some kind of uh, anechoic structures, lesions, let's say we are trying to find out the gallbladder and then we find that there are some amount of noise artifacts coming around the wall, then in those situations, uh, tissue harmonic helps in kind of reducing those noise and better delineate the, the structures. Sometimes there are uh, certain kinds of side lobe artifacts that happen. So whenever there is an anechoic kind of or a hypoechoic kind of a structure, we get uh, another uh, similar kind of a, um, anechoic area on the on the margins of this. This is known as the side lobe artifact. So these kind of artifacts can be reduced with the use of tissue harmonics. That can be done. Okay, right. And then there's a question, how many, uh, how long is the learning curve for diagnostic EOS? Um, <laughs> well, Depends on how much hand you get on the scope <laughs> and how much time you spend on it clearly. But I'd say, you know, I'd say at least 200 US before you can actually be confident in terms of at least showing the proper structure. What do you think about it, Chanta? Yeah, I think I am absolutely, I, I agreed. It's definitely, it's not about the time, it's probably more time and, uh, as well as uh, kind of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Shankar, what do you think? What's your thought on that? I would certainly agree with you. Nothing less than 150 is sufficient. I think we need to keep evolving every procedure whenever we are early in the stages. Every procedure must be considered as... Uh, 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 we must try to identify all structures in every procedure that keeps on adding. And I would definitely agree. Nothing less than 150 is sufficient at times for most of us. Absolutely. And yeah. I and think I'd just like to add on one point, I think is that, I mean, if you do 50 uh, routine diagnostic with uh, looking at collateral lithiasis will not help. I mean, also the range of uh, kind of... Uh, certainly, cases. certainly. Yeah. 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 And I, I would uh, these, also yeah. commend, uh, yeah. sorry, just... Go ahead, go ahead. Just one thing. Because um, Janta has made a wonderful point that 
therapeutic EUS is easier uh, than uh, the diagnostic one. You need to spend a lot of time doing uh, diagnostic, learning all the structures and abnormalities than therapeutic. Just training in uh, pseudocyst will be much easier than identifying uh, an occult malignancy in uncinet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, it's uh, the point is that I think you have to be thorough, understand, and also be thorough, and uh, not rush through EUS as a lot of people uh, may do in their busy practice can get challenging for them. But uh, but as as in when you learn, you need to be able to identify and then be very thorough and ensure that you actually do a good job at the examination. Um, there's another question: How many days of observation required under mentor as a beginner, and how should one choose a center? I believe smaller centers better. You suggested advice. Okay, how many days? Um, I don't know. I it's hard for me to imagine like a seven day exercise will get you up there into <laughs> doing it. I think what you I don't, I, have I, to I do don't is multiple. Things. I agree. Uh, I I don't think so. I mean, I, I think hopefully sessions like this give a bit of a perspective. Uh, but of course, it's not enough, and you have to probably do multiple week long uh, sort of uh, uh, observerships if i may and then go back and forth in my opinion maybe if you're not under a training program then maybe just observe for a week go back at your center do it a few times go back for another observership pick up from what you learned build on it then exercise that and then go back and maybe a, a few few sort of going back and forth may make a difference in in, in the setting of not having a, a dedicated training program for you to get into you know a smaller center well i i wouldn't know about that which centers would be good or not um but certainly somebody who knows what they're doing is important um smaller or larger shouldn't matter uh, any thoughts janta yeah i think i absolutely agree with you we uh, the uh, only other issue is if somebody does not have a kind of uh, access to this kind of a training process definitely yes there are various kinds of videos available on youtube on asg they have multiple videos so those you can i mean someone can kind of go through them and then attend these kinds of didactic lectures and all and probably that can assist in the in the speeding up the process of learning maybe yeah okay and Dr. Khaled Bamak Rama is mentioning the importance of seeing IVC. Yes, uh, IVC and SME from the second part. Yes, I, I think you, you made a good point. I, we should have included that. Um, but uh, just as you look at the unsinet process, the vascular structures next to it, next to it, would you would be able to identify the SMB and the SME actually? Okay. All right. Uh, I think we could wrap up now. It's within our yeah. time frame here. Um, so that no one's late on a Saturday night because uh, COVID's down and I think people are out and about now. <laughs> so no one's no one Saturday night is, is getting spoiled, I guess. <laughs> okay. So, great. Thank Wonderful. You. Okay, I think there is okay. uh, just one Thank more question. Do you think? Uh, yeah, well, I think we can just wrap up there. There's one question from Christopher Gonzalez. Do you think learning trans at Don Ultrasound first are great before holding an EUS scope? I don't know. I mean, I, I guess just to learn the basics, but no, you don't have to. You can just start seeing, you'll pick up, and that's okay. All right. Okay, great. So thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Delta, for coming today. And uh, for everyone who wants to learn FNA and FNB, we'll have Dr. Vinay the talk and then just a little bit of demonstration, including uh, cleaning and disinfection basics by Olympus team, which is very important. And uh, of course, every endosonographer needs to know all of that too. And uh, we, uh, we can answer some of these questions in the chat box, maybe uh, after as they sort of came in a little later. Okay, I'll, I'll probably just email them. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. Bye, sir. Should you just can you email me the questions on the chat box? I'll just email everyone. It's eight twenty-five. Yes, sir. I'll I'll do that. Yeah, we'll do that, sir. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thank, thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Saurabh. We'll catch up tomorrow at ten. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Bye.